morning, everyone. Beautiful day outside, isn't it? Beautiful drive in this morning. It was a great time. It was, uh, we, we went for a walk yesterday in the woods and uh, uh, just see the peace and the, um, the beauty of God's creation it was amazing. So um, let's start this morning. We'll pray and then we'll, we'll get going with the message. Um, Lord, thank you for being here. Thank you for gathering uh, all of us here. Uh, give us the desire to come and worship you, um, to hear your word, um, to uh, look within our hearts um, and, uh, and be more pleasing to you. Open, uh, open my lips to say things that uh, come from you uh, and uh, parts, uh, my heart as well, to receive uh, your word the way uh, you wanted it to be uh, taught. I ask in your precious name. So, uh, it's been a little while since I, I'm going to take this off here because this is annoying. Um, it's been a little while since I've preached, um, but I had a week of vacation this week, so I had some, uh, had some time to uh, to prepare this, and actually it was a good time. I, I went up to see my grandmother in Quebec, and uh, it was really quiet. And Actually, we talked about a lot of things that uh, related to this, uh, this message today. So if you remember well, um, I, I started preaching about the church. Uh, I started, just personally, I wanted to find out more about the church. So we started, I think it was a year ago, uh, in Acts. Acts 2 and what the church did there, and then we moved on to uh, a little further in Acts, and now we're in Revelation where uh, the, Act, the Acts church was the church right after uh, Jesus' res resurrection. Now we're looking at the church 60 years later in Revelation, and the seven churches of, of Asia or Turkey today, uh, and what they look like. And so... Um, the context here is that we're in Revelation, we're in Revelation 2, uh, it's 95 AD, John, the, the Apostle John is in, on the island of Patmos, he was sent there uh, to be, um, essentially, uh, the emperor thought he was, he was going to die there, so he said just send him there, uh, so he wouldn't cause any more trouble. Um, eventually John got off the island and got back to Ephesus, he was the bishop there, um, and uh, God gives a vision to John of what the end times are going to be. And so uh, chapter 1 of Revelation is, this, is explaining the vision. Chapter 2 and 3 is the church age. Um, so it talks specifically of historical churches that actually were in Turkey at the time, for which John was, was, uh, uh, has some level of oversight. And then at the end of chapter 3, the rapture happens, and then the tribulations start. Um, chapter 2 and 3 are true historical churches in those times, but they're also warnings, uh, and you'll, we'll see that through the passage. They're also warnings to all of us in the church age uh, as to what uh, a good church needs to do. And so this is where we're at today. Um, the, um, so we've got the seven churches. We covered the first two, right? So we did Ephesus. And what was Ephesus? What was the Ephesus church? What was the Ephesus church lack, lacking? Love, right? So it was it was a church that had. Um, if you want to turn to Revelations two, we're in uh, we're at page nineteen fourteen in the church Bible. The church at Ephesus was a church that lacked love. So it had fallen in love with Christ. It was under much persecution, and, but, um, and it was following the word, but it didn't have the same love it had at the beginning. And then we went to Smyrna. And what was the issue with Smyrna? No issue in Smyrna. It was a beautiful church, right? They were poor. They were very poor, um, but they had Christ, so they were ultimately eternally rich. And so that's what we saw in my last uh, message. And so um, now we take it and we talk, today we're gonna talk about the church at Pergamum um, and, uh, and let's get into it. So 
We're in uh, Revelations 2, we're in verse 12, uh, the, to the angel of the church in Pergamum, right? We're going to read the whole passage and then we're going to go uh, sentence by sentence after that. So we're going to read the whole passage. To the, to the angel of the church of Pergamum, right? These are the words of him who has the sharp double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city, where Satan lives. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold the teachings of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you, and I will fight with them with the sword of my mouth. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. So let's start there. So to the angel of the church in Pergamum. Um, we've seen this, right? All the letters are the same. At, at the very beginning is, is, uh, is the same. Uh, the angel, uh, the, the Greek word uh, translates into angel or messenger. So uh, it's, it's really the messenger that brings the letter to the, to the, um, uh, to the church. Uh, likely their pastor, somebody that would have come and saw John and personally, and then that would have brought the message back to uh, to Pergamum. Um, so it's essentially to the person that brings the message back to the church. Um, then there's this um, very scary sentence. These are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. <clears throat> I don't know about you, but if somebody was to send me, if I sent you a letter, Paul, and that said, him who has the loaded gun, or him who has a, a weapon, one, you'd be pretty upset, two, you'd probably look pretty seriously at what the letter says, right? Um, it's a pretty stern start to a letter. Um, <clears throat> a sharp, double-edged sword, so we're talking about a weapon. A little, little bit chilling right there. Um, so let's find out who this person is and who this weapon hit, what, what this weapon does. Um, so Revelation actually tells us who the person is. If you go back to Revelations 1, verse 12 to 18, you don't need to turn on it, I, I got it, but just a, a page before, John describes what he's seeing. And in the second part of verse 16, he says, and, come in mouth of, and coming out of his mouth, so John sees this person, right? And coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. He goes on to describe what he's seeing in verse, and in verse 17 he says, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I'm alive forever and ever. So, who's the person? Jesus. Right? So it's Jesus who died, resurrected, and now is in his glory. And John is seeing the resurrected Christ in his glory, telling him um, this, this message. And so the, the person with the double edge, the sharp double edged sword in his mouth, is Jesus Christ. So the words of the latter are from Jesus personally. So what does this sharp double-edged sword do? Like, what does it do? Um, the answer is also in Revelation for that one. So if you turn with me to Revelations 19, which is a few pages past 1935 is the, is the, is the uh, page in the church Bible. Uh, Revelations 19, we start at verse 11. I saw, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. 
With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head there are many crowns. He has a name written on it that no one knows but himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven are following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. So again, we see our, our rider is who? Jesus Christ, right? He has a sword coming out of his mouth. What does the sword do? It's there to strike the nations. It's an instrument of judgment. So Jesus comes back to judge the nations for their disobedience. Um, and it, it really is uh, this instrument of judgment that Christ uses against his enemies. So right off the bat, this letter starts off very different than the first two, right? So the first two letters to the churches, the first one, he says, he, he who, um, who walks among the lampstands and the, um, and, and the stars, and, and that holds the stars in the hands, so the angels were in his hands. That means the messengers of the churches were in his hands. He was walking amongst the churches, Right, very comforting kind of mess start to the letter for Ephesus. The letter, the letters, the, the letters, the letter to Smyrna um, was what? Anybody remember? It says, "I am the first and the last, the Alpha, the, Mo, the Omega." So I, I was live, I was dead, and I'm alive. So very comforting again to the church of Smyrna being that Christ is there always, uh, is, is now alive and protecting them, right? This one has a whole new different meaning to it, different feel to it. He starts with, I got a sharp sword in my mouth and I'm ready to strike. It's a very, very different feel to this letter. Very, so very serious, when we look at this letter, it's very important to understand the seriousness of what Jesus is telling us. So, let's find out what's going on in Pergamum. First portion of the letter. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. That's pretty amazing. Um... That means that Satan's headquarters were in Pergamum. Satan had his throne right in that city. And so that church was literally living in enemy territory. Pergamum was a city full of idolatry. It was, um, I, I invite you to look it up. It's an amazing, beautiful city. There's this giant Acropolis where you, a very high up mountain and the city is probably beneath it, maybe 2,000 feet. It's gorgeous. Um, but at the top of the mountain, um, the Pergamians uh, built this giant temple to many, many deities. Um, and one of them was an altar to Zeus. It was this giant altar that had, that was a hundred feet by a hundred feet. It was U-shaped like a throne. And it was a hundred feet by a hundred feet. It's actually in Berlin now in, in a museum to Pergamum. Um, there's a replica of it. Um, there's this giant altar to Zeus there, shaped like a throne. And so that could be what this letter refers to. Um, there was also uh, several temples in that city. There was uh, Diodemus, Athena, uh, Asclepius also had a, a lot of, um, had a, they had a temple there where you went in and, and uh, to get, um, they call it Asclepions. Um, they were like hospitals because back then uh, the medicine and, and sorcery were kind of mixed. Um, and so you, you would go there and you would, lay in, in the temple and the snakes would crawl all, there'd be snakes in the temple and there'd be snakes all over you. And that, that was the god of healing. Um, so Asclepius was, was a big deity, deity there. Um, but 
more prominently and probably where this letter is referring to is Pergamus was the first place in the east uh, where emperor, emperor cult was established. So um, Pergamum was the seat, essentially the, the main place where you worshipped the emperor. Um, and so uh, it, it was, it was a, a, a city full of vile, vile idolatry. Um, so now you see this church, this small church, operating within Satan's, Satan loves idolatry, you know, he's the, he's the mastermind behind idolatry, right? So he has his throne there, and there they are, right in enemy territory, operating um, and, and living as uh, Christians. Very, very tough place. For somebody to operate, I think today of somebody that would have, you know, that would be in a church in Pyongyang or um, uh, North Korea or in China, right next to the uh, communist, like where you know there's a, there's an idolatrous worship of the people that that rule that country. That would be the kind of you know mirror image for today's um, church. So there they are, living in this this place that has full of, full of idolatry and people are following these false gods um, and their whole lives are based on these deities, right? But then we go, then Jesus, is go, Jesus goes on and says, yet you remain true to my name. That's wonderful, isn't it? You're in the enemy territory, but then yet Jesus commands you for remaining uh, true to his name. And see how personal Jesus makes the relationship with believers, right? You remain true to my name. That's how, that's how personal Christianity, that's, how, that's this personal relationship that we have with Christ that comes out here. And again, in the next, next portion, you did not renounce your faith in me, right? Not even in the days of Antipas, uh, and we'll talk about Antipas a little later. My faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. You did not renounce your faith in me, my faithful witness. Right? It's always, when, when you come to Christ, he, he owns you. Right? There's this deep personal relationship with Christ that comes through, and it comes through the, the, the text here. And you see this church that even in the midst of great tribulations, Antipas, we don't know much about Antipas. There's, he's, that's the only place where he's mentioned in the Bible. All the rest is tradition. Tradition says um, that he was the bishop, uh, or the, the, the pastor, um, of the church, and that he was put to death in the, uh, he was cooked, essentially, as an as an altar offering uh, in a in a brass bowl, he was put in a bowl and actually cooked in there. That's the that's the tradition. That's the tradition that says that's that's what happened to Antipas, um, because he would not um, worship the emperor. He would not. So once a year, they had to offer incense um, to the to the emperor. He would not. And uh, they grabbed them and, and put them put in a bowl and, and killed them, murdered them. Um, and so even in the midst of that great persecution, and, and maybe that's Antipas, maybe it's mentioned in Antipas, but there was many more that were, that were killed as part of this purge. Um, we see the, the persecution that comes if, if one of us here or you know, I, I, I was actually killed, what kind of effect would that have on the, on the body, right? Um, and so, even through that, they did not renounce. They did not renounce Christ's name and the gospel. That's pretty good. Um, that's awesome, actually. Um, here's a faithful witness that died for Christ. Uh, here's a church that followed Christ through this persecution. 
and Christ is commending them for that loyalty, right? That's amazing. This is a city full of darkness, in the, in the pits, in the, in, the, in the darkest of darkest places, and here's this lighthouse that, that stays. Right, so why does the introduction say what it does? It's really weird, right? You just look at this wonderful little church in the middle of enemy territory, and you wonder why, why, the, why the weapon at the beginning? Well, there was something bad that infiltrated the church. All right? So we go to the next portion. Here he goes. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality. Ooh. So this was, a, this was a church that held to Jesus' name, yet some people in that church held on to idolatry and sex, sexual immorality. For those who may not be familiar with the story of Balaam, uh, it's in Numbers, uh, Numbers 21. Um, Balaam's a sorcerer. He's a sorcerer for hire. Um, guy that likes money. Uh, and do just about anything for it. Uh, he was asked by Balak, the king of Moab, to come and curse Israel. Israel's coming out, and they're coming to take over the, the Canaan, and Moab is really, really scared. And so he sends his messengers over to Balaam and says, come on over, I need you to curse Israel so that they don't destroy us completely. Um... God tells him, no, you're not going. He figures out a way to go anyways, at which point he almost gets killed doing it. Um, and then he ends up going, and what happens there is God does not allow him to curse Israel. And then the story ends. A little bit later on, a couple chapters later, you see the Moabites and the Midianite women um, having sexual relationships and um, essentially praising the Baal of Baal of Peor or this idol. Um, so they essentially, so, and a little bit later on, you find out that Balaam was behind the plan. Um, if, you, if you read through Numbers, um, numbers, tell, numbers 25 tells us while Israel was staying in Shittim, the man began to indulge in sexual immorality with Moabite women who invited them to sacrifice to their gods. The people ate the sacrificial meal and bowed down before these gods. So Israel yoked themselves to the Baal of Peor and the Lord's anger burned against them. That was, ba that was Balaam's plan. When he saw that he couldn't curse them, he found a way to trick them into cursing themselves. That was Balaam's plan, and it worked. In that day, that day alone, 24,000 people in the camp of Israel died. It was um, a terrible thing because they had given, God had redeemed them from Egypt, right? Got them out, fed them, gave them everything they needed through the journey in the, in the wilderness. Now they were just about to take over Canaan. And again, Israel drops God and decides to go after another fake God. And so God's anger burned against them. And so what we see here is very similar in Pergamum, right? You have this group of people that, that even though they still hang on to Christ um, or are within the, the, the realm of the church, really have their hearts set on idols, on a culture, on the world of that day. And so God will not allow his church 
to be unpure. So, just like he didn't allow Israel to do what they did in the wilderness, God will not allow his church to, to stand with people that are idolatrous and sexual, sexually immoral. Jesus continues here. We do not, uh, so likewise you have, you also have those who hold to the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Now we don't know much about the Nicolaitans. It's, they're mentioned twice in Revelations, that's it. Um, again, nothing, not, nothing really biblical here, uh, but um, there's, there's, they're twice in Revelations, both times uh, likely referring to morality and idolatry. So very similar here. Um, I don't think if, if, if God would have wanted us to know what the Nicolaitan sect was all about, he would have told us. In this case, we know that, they're, we know that God hates their works from, from a little earlier in Revelations. And we know that, again, here he mentions them as um, being um, against them. And so we have these people that are within this church that are really enemies of God. And so you have, you have this, this great church that holds up Jesus' name, and we have these um, people within it that hold um, these, these false teachings, these false prophets, these wolves are inside the camp. Um, and so Jesus says, repent therefore, Otherwise, I will soon come to you, and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Now, I found this statement very strange, because originally when I, wrote the, when I, when I read this letter, I thought he was talking about the idolatrous people to repent. But look at how the language reads. It says... Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you, and I will fight against them with the word of my mouth. If the idolatrous people in the church are them, he's not writing the letter to, he's saying them for a reason, right? He's not writing the letter to them, he's pointing them out as them. So who's he writing this to? To a church. He's writing this to the church. He's writing, he's telling the church, repent of allowing people in your church that are idolatrous and immoral. That's what he's saying here. There's, he's calling the, the idolatrous people to, to repent as well, but this is not the main theme of the passage. The main theme of the passage is Jesus speaking to his church, telling the church, you have to kick these people out. They don't belong in the church. Because you know what? They're enemies. They're enemies of my word. They're enemies of my gospel. There cannot be any compromise in my church. My church needs to be pure. So the church has to repent and not allow the Zimri's, Zimri was the, the main guy in the Balaam stories, the wolves, the false prophets that are within its bound, cannot allow them to operate within the church. We cannot allow compromise within the body. This is what Jesus is telling the church. This is the warning. Look at the wording again. What happened when, what happened when Israel um, sinned and Zimri led them through this idolatrous immorality? 24,000 people went with them, died that day. If you allow people within the church to bring false witness, to bring false teachings, to compromise with the world, there's going to be, they're going to, they're going to bring people in. They're going to bring people with them, and there's going to be great judgment. There's a sword, there's a sharp-edged sword coming. And this is what Jesus is warning about. 
Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So this is for all of us. This was written specifically for the church of Pergamum in 95 AD. But the principles of it applied to this church, the next church, and the church that comes after us. Are we sitting, are you sitting here today arboring idolatry in your heart? What drives your life? I, uh, it, it was amazing. I'm, I'm a, I'm a Michigan fan and, uh, you know, it was a great win yesterday. Um, but all I heard yesterday was this is the greatest moment of my life from fans that have nothing to, like, I mean, it's got nothing to do and I know because I was stuck in that idolatry before I came to Christ. I, my sports team was my idol. Is that what drives your life? It could be your job. It could be your bank account. It could be your spouse, your kids, your family, your parents. It could be your school. What drives your life? On the immorality front, are you finding ways to rationalize something, anything other than a godly marriage in the sexual realm? I mean, everybody's doing it. Why not me, right? Why not? Everybody's moving in with somebody they're not married to. Believers are marrying unbelievers. It's okay. No, it's not. No, it's not. Purity starts within our own heart. So where are we? Let's start there. Right? Where are we, each of us? And I'm guilty of it and and that's why I need brothers and sisters to tell me when I when I mess up because sometimes we don't see that within ourselves for those who've been Christians a long time have we gone back to some of our old habits did we did we leave our first love maybe it's just easier to live with our parents or our sons and daughters and our spouses if we just compromise a little bit. And I'm not talking about, you know, compromises outside of God's word, but when it comes to God's revelation, are we 100% in with no compromise? Just because it's better for our coworkers or more, easier for people around us, easier for me, really, because then I don't have to fight with anybody or nobody thinks I'm a weirdo because I'm holding on to these weird teachings. But beyond that, beyond our own selves, let's start there. But beyond that, do you see a brother or sister that's harboring a sin and you're just letting them get away with it? Just not saying anything. It's our responsibility, it's your responsibility to go to that brother and sister and say, hey, this isn't right. Ram taught just a few weeks ago on church discipline, and it's, it doesn't have to be church discipline if you just go to your brother and sister and say, hey, this isn't right, and that brother and sister says, I repent. And what, did, what does the Bible say about that? You won them over. It's like a great win for for the church because you won them over you saved them from the sin that's a loving responsibility to our brothers and sisters in the church is to go to them and say hey there's sin in your life i'm here for you i'm going to help you through it let's let's work you know let's let's make sure this goes away Let's fight it together. Let's pray. Let's hold each other accountable. That's how a church is supposed to operate. If you're not sure how to do it, 
Go to Matthew 18, tells you the whole process. It's very simple. Now, what does it take? It takes courage. It takes lots of love. It takes self-denying because it takes time and effort to do that. Right? It's a lot easier to say, you know, my brother's, he'll deal with his own problems. I got my own. Yeah, it takes time. It takes courage. It takes perhaps even losing a friendship. But it's worth it. That's what Jesus wants. The life we're called to live as Christians is a war. It's a war. It's a war between good and evil. The small church in Pergamum was in enemy territory. And what they were doing is they were allowing the enemy to infiltrate small little things, right? It wasn't, nobody was out here preaching to go, you know, to the temple and, you know, to, 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 to sleep with prostitutes. Nobody was up at the, at the, in Pergamum, but it was little things. It's okay to burn the incense. Right? As long as you got Jesus, it's okay to bring, burn the incense to, to Caesar. You, he'll, he'll forgive you. Right? They were living by Satan's throne, and they were allowing soldiers of the other camp to infiltrate their camp. You can't have that. They could endure because of God's gracious love, and we can too. And we need God's wisdom in dealing with those issues, because those are difficult issues to deal with. But we're also called, every single one of the other one, the, the people around you today are your, combat, are your fellow combatants. We're in a war, we're in a war of trenches with, with Satan. So when you see a fellow soldier falling down and, and maybe defecting to the other side, what, what do you do? What's your responsibility? You've got to go save them. You know we've got the victory, victorious side. Why would they give up? Right? The victory is, always, is already won. The victory was won on the cross. Jesus got it. We just have to fight just a little longer. And so that's the message coming out at the end of the letter. What does it say? To the one who is victorious, the one who goes through this, this journey, this pilgrimage that we're on on the earth here, I will give some of the hidden manna. Again, going back to a reference to the wilderness journey for Israel, what was the manna? This is what the Israelites ate, right, during the desert. That's what kept them through this, this desert period of their, of their lives. He fed them. And so here we're taught, and we're told by Jesus, I'm going to give you some of the hidden manna. So what's the hidden manna? Who's the bread of life? Jesus, right? The hidden manna is Jesus. All we need is him. He's, he's won it. He's done it all for us. He's got all the spiritual resources. He's got all the resources. He is the manna. I will also, it's not, that's it, that's not it. It's not it, all right? I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. There's a lot, there's a lot of theories on what the white stone means, and you can look it up if you want, but the, the one that's most widely accepted um, uh, because it was written to Romans at that time, is that when you won an athletic competition in, in Rome, they gave you a white stone with your name on it, and that was your ticket to go to the award ceremony. So when you, when you went to the award ceremony after, you gave them the stone, and that was, it was written with your name on it. And so that... I, I, I believe that's what it refers to here, and it, it follows very well in the text because it says, God's got your name. First of all, you'll get a new name because everything's going to be new. A name that only you and God know. This, again, the personal relationship that you have with, with the Creator, with the Creator God. 
and then what? You're going to be able to take your white stone and go to the New Jerusalem, the place where there's no, no crying, no pain, and we're going to be with Jesus forever. What a wonderful, wonderful promise for those who hold on to the to the uh, to, to God's name, to Jesus's name, to Jesus's gospel. So when you see a brother and sister falling away, what's our responsibility? We have to go see. We have to go and get them. And so, in order for us to see that, and I was thinking about that a lot, in order for us to see that, we have to lift with one another, right? Because nobody's going to actually sin in, in the middle of church on a so He could, but realistically, we're, we're better hypocrites than that. Um, you know, nobody sins on this. So what does, it, what does it entail? It means that as a church, we need to live as a community. We need to learn to, to live with one another, to understand each other, to spend time with one another so that when these sins pop up in our lives, we have brothers that are account, that were, and sisters that we're accountable to and that can say, hey, that's not good. The Christian life is not a life that's meant to live alone. You cannot be a Christian. It's way too easy for Satan when you're alone. Right? There's too many temptations, not enough support. God built the church as your support system to be accountable to others, but also to hold others accountable so that, what? We can be victorious and we can get this white stone and we can all be... How awesome it's going to be to be in the New Jerusalem. Can we not pull through 70 years down here of war and do it with brothers and sisters that love us. I think that's an awesome, awesome uh, message. And so let us not compromise. I got a story on compromise and I'll leave you on that because I'm well past my time. Um, a hunter went out into the forest to shoot a bear. With winter fast approaching, he planned to make a warm coat out of the bear skin. Soon he saw a bear coming towards him, and he raised his gun and took aim. Wait, said the bear. What do you want? Why do you want to shoot me? The hunter replied, because I'm cold. The bear replied, but I'm hungry, so maybe we can reach an agreement. In the end, the hunter was well enveloped with the bear's fur, and the bear had eaten his dinner. What would have been the right thing for the, for the hunter to do? Don't dialogue with the bear, right? Just shoot him. Don't dialogue with the bear. So we're called to do the same thing. In the end, that hunter lost his life because he just chatted with the bear just a little too long. Smidge second but he got what he wanted. Let us not be the foolish hunter who had the right idea, the right tools to do what he needed, but didn't pull the trigger. Let us be wise and not compromise with the enemy. Let's pray. Lord, um, it's not easy. It's not easy to follow your word. It's not easy to um, go out in the world and, and appear foolish to others. It's not easy to be mocked. It's not easy to be persecuted. And yet, Lord, we hear, we, um, we, we, have, we have very little reasons to be even scared or, or shy about sharing your gospel. Um, and yet, Lord, we, we stop ourselves because of ridicule and mocking. Um, Lord, it's, give us the strength. We can't do it without you. We, uh, we don't have it within our heart to, to hold, hold on to you. We need you every step of the way. We need you to, to give us wisdom, to give us love um, beyond understanding so that we can love our brothers and sisters 
and not only love our brothers and sisters here, but love those outside who are perishing, um, those who don't know you, those who um, reject you, Lord. Let us pray for them. Um, and Lord, give us pure hearts. Give us, give us this purity in our hearts, uh, a heart that is unblemished by idolatry, unblemished by um, any sort of sexual immorality, um, any, anything that we hold, that we withhold from you, Lord, anything that does not put you as the ultimate reason of our being, Lord, help us get rid of it. I, show it to us and help us deal with it drastically. Let us pull the trigger on those things, on that bear. We need to, Lord. Don't let us rationalize. Don't let us just do it. No matter the cost, do it in our lives. Let us do what's right so that we can be with you and so that we can um, uh, bear many fruits, bring many to you as well. We ask for all these things in your precious name.